All right, thank you. Thank you, Floro, for this opportunity. I'm, I'm very impressed by how many people are here. Uh, I hope you can hear me at the back of the room. Otherwise, just ask me to speak louder. Uh, so I will not really try to answer this question because it's a bit of a silly question. You told me just to give a title so that people would come. And you know, with a <laughs> good title and a free lunch, we said probably there's going to be people. Uh, probably it's a silly question just because you know, uh, it's, I mean, cancer is not a joke. It's a very important thing for, for many people who are confronted with it. And, and it's clear that big data alone will not cure cancer. What I'm going to try to discuss is more uh, how data impacts research and research in biology and even the medical practice and whether we can expect to see some big improvement towards perhaps not curing, but at least better treating and one day curing cancer. Uh, we are very, very far from that for the moment. So I understand that the audience probably is very heterogeneous. Um, pro there may be biologists, there may be people who've never heard of biology. What I'm going to try to do is uh, you know, give a broad overview of why we talk of big data in, in biology and in the medical system, why it could have an impact, and then I will describe more practically some of the things we've been working on and which, which we try to highlight some difficulties with this data and why it's not so easy. All right, so, so to start with, again, I will be kind of very approximative. Um, uh, half of what I'm going to say may be wrong, but the other half is going to be true. And, and this is just to give so, some picture about uh, you know, where we are and what we can do. So I'm going to talk of biology. Uh, biology has been a very experimental science. As Flor was saying, science is about data, but you know, not all science are based on data. There are science based on a lot of experiments, manipulations, knowledge acquisition. So I in spite of that, there is a lot of possible data in biology. And just to give you, some, some, you know, one example, uh, when you take a body, it's made of many, many cells. So the, 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 the basic unit of a living thing is always a cell. We have roughly hundreds of several hundreds of trillions of cells in one body. All the cells are derived from a unique cell. You know, when, when, when parents meet and make an embryo, an embryo is one cell, and, they, and then by successive divisions into two sub, uh, daughter cells and more, you have an exponential growth, and at the end you get a lot of cells. Okay, so this is the basic unit. And in each of the cells, you have many things, including DNA. So DNA is like a book where the, you know, the secret of life is written in a sense. You have DNA for humans, DNA for other species. Uh, a DNA is a polymer uh, made of many uh, small pieces glued together. So the, the, the DNA is encoded in chromosomes. It's a polymer. And, and to make a long story short, you can think of the, of the DNA as a long sequence of ACGT. And there are roughly 6 billion letters. So it's a long text of 6 billion letters, like a big book written in each cell in each of the many cells of your body. In theory, all, all the DNA, so all the cells of your body have the same DNA in theory, because each time you have duplication of a cell into two, two cells, DNA is duplicated and it's supposed to be a, a good process without errors. In practice, there are errors. We estimate that each time a cell divides in two, it needs to replicate its DNA to give it to the daughter cells. And among the six billion letters, there are a few tens of errors typically, just in terms of uh, a that becomes a C, for example. Okay, so it seems to be very few, and it's a very good process. Just 10 out of 6 billion is pretty efficient, except that, as we will see, this is enough to be the cause of cancer. So I will explain why. But before that, so so this is just the biology. Now, why do we have data? There are many. Uh, for me, the main reason is that the technology has changed, the, has been a game changer in this field. There are different technologies, microarrays, proteomics, etc. But I will just mention one of them which is sequencing. So by sequencing, we mean a, a machine that takes a DNA, a, a molecule as input, and outputs the sequence of the DNA. Okay? The goal is to decrypt, if I go back here, the sequence of A, C, G, T. So doing this thing is called sequencing. Uh, and, and you know, sequencing the DNA is a way to read this, this book uh, written in each cell and try to understand it, probably at some point. Uh, 15 years ago, uh, the human genome was sequenced, meaning for, you know, it took 10 years and several billions of dollars to take a few human cells, extract the DNA, and through some big international collaboration to sequence these things. So it was like the Apollo project of biology. And then people said, finally, we have the human genome. Let's study it. We're going to study the secret of life. What happened since uh, 15 years ago is that the costs and the time needed to sequence has dropped at some amazing rate, uh, pace. Right? You, you, can, you don't need to see the details, but the, the white lines here 
is Moore's law that describes how computer, computers progress. So it's known that every, uh, is it every few years, the size of your hard disk increases, the speed of your processor increases, right? This is roughly the speed. The, the, the green lines here is the progress in the cost of sequencing. And uh, the, the so uh, the, the vertical axis is a log scale. It goes from $100 million in, uh, in 2001 to $1,000 today. And now we, we've reached a point where sequencing a human genome, which again costed $3 billion in 2000, now costs $1,000. So what does that mean? It means that probably everybody in this room is going to be sequenced within few years, right? It, it, because it will continue to drop. Of course, you, you may want not to be sequenced, but it's going to be just like you know, a blood test. You, take, you, you sequence your DNA. It's a common thing. It also means that we can, we can sequence many parts of your bodies if for some reasons there are differences in DNA, etc. And it means that we can collect a lot of data. So in terms of data, you know, it's cheap, but it fills easily several hard disks. You know, you, you get terabytes or petabytes of data produced very frequently now in, in most sequencing center. If you want to see a sequencing machine, just go to the, to the lab of biology of ENS or to Institut Curie. They have these small machines. You know, you, you prepare a sample, you put it there, you click the button, you wait for, uh, 24 hours or 48 hours, and you get your hard disk fill, filled with sequences. All right, so uh, something, uh, the reason, so sequencing is interesting, gives you the DNA, but in fact, uh, now the, this machine, the sequencing machine, is in fact used for many, many other things. It's like a Swiss knife, because, you know, biologists are very smart, and they, they, they design ways to use the machine, not only to read the DNA, but to read other things. So, uh, you know, just to give one example, for example, uh, when you take the, the DNA, one reason why it's important is that on the DNA, you have short parts called the genes, which code for proteins. So wh when a cell requires, when a blood cell needs hemoglobin to, you know, to produce hemoglobin, it reads a sequence in the DNA that codes for hemoglobin. Then uh, it translates, it transcribes it, so it creates a, pro uh, a molecule called RNA that will then be used to make hemoglobin, right? So this thing, this RNA can be read to with sequencing machines. Meaning that if you take a cell, it's possible to use the sequencing machine not to read the DNA, but to read the activity of the cells in terms of how much hemoglobin is producing if it's, if it's a blood cell. And of course, hemoglobin is not very interesting, but we have roughly 20,000 genes in, in, encoded in our DNA. And it's possible in one experiment in, to, to take a, a biological sample and to sequence all the RNA meaning it gives you an idea of what is activated in each cell, which genes are activated, which proteins will be produced, et cetera. All right, so this is using safe technology. There are other things you can measure, interactions between DNA, proteins, et cetera. So it's really a Swiss knife now that, that produces a lot of data. Okay, so how does that relate to, to cancer, which is, uh, which is the, the title uh, of the talk? So uh, again, to make a very uh, long story short in one slide, uh, so cancer is a, is, is a important disease, second cause of mortality, I think, uh, in France and in advanced uh, rich countries. Uh, cancer is, is a disease of, of our cells, right? It's not a virus, it's not something else. Uh, remember that I said we have hundreds of trillions of cells which are obtained by successive divisions into two cells of the other cells. So on the left here, you have a normal process of creating cells. Normally, a normal cell gives two normal cells, which give two normal cells, etc. It stops at some point. Your neurons, they don't divide anymore. Uh, you are, uh, you know, di di once your cells get specialized, they have different uh, mechanisms to divide or not, but they, they are normal. Cancer, it, at some point, is when a cell, probably because of random mutations, you know, I said there are a few tens of mutations in each time there's a division, it, most of them will have no impact. Most, you know, most mutations, you can have them in your DNA, they will not impact how the cell works. If you're unlucky, one mutation may be in a bad place, meaning it could give, for example, the cell, some strength and, 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 and strength meaning the cell can continue to divide very quickly or can divide faster than the other ones or become insensitive to the signals around, around it that tells it stops, uh, stop dividing. And so cancer is basically uh, cells that become crazy and just divide and divide and divide again, right? And the reason why they divide is, again, it's, it's, it's very approximative, but it's roughly that their DNA has been changed and now their, their book in their cell, the DNA tells them, well, just divide, divide, and divide. Okay, so in a sense, the, the cancer cells are the strongest in your body. They, they, they take the, the lead over the other ones and they create a tumor, et cetera, and, and can lead to uh, very bad uh, effects. 
All right, so how, how can we study cancer, uh, cancer cells? Well, uh, approximately, you know, 100 years, uh, 100 years ago, uh, people started looking at the microscope. microscope. These are uh, blood, uh, blood cells, and among them, you could discern some cells which look a bit different. So these are, this is a, a cancer. This is, uh, I cannot say which one, it's kind of leukemia, probably. And, and you can observe that the, the cancer cells are a bit different. They have different shapes, different texture. Uh, so, something looks different at, at this resolution. 50 years ago, it became uh, possible to look at inside of each cell to look at the chromosomes. And when people started looking at chromosomes, the, the picture is a bit um, hard to see here, but on the top you have the chromosome you expect in a normal cell. So in each of your cell, you should have 46 chromosomes if you're a human being, uh, 23 coming from your father, 23 from your mother. So they, are two, they come two by two. Uh, and this is what you expect. Now, if you look at the same picture for a cancer cell, people started to, to notice that things have changed at the level of chromosomes. Like some chromosomes, instead of having two copies, you have three copies here in chromosome seven. Other things which are hard to see on this screen is that some chromosomes seem to be made of a fusion of norm, uh, different normal chromosomes. So in a sense, the DNA has been messed up. It's not clear how. I mean, we, now we know, we know a lot about that, but uh, the DNA has changed. And so it fits the idea that because the DNA has changed, at least just in the structure of the chromosomes, then this cell, the cell that has this thing, may behave differently from a normal human cell. And this is what, what you know, uh, uh, this is what is a cancer cell. All right. So this, is, uh, this was uh, 50 years ago. Now, when we talk of cancer, that's the kind of picture we get. This thing is some, it's not artistic, but some visually nice view of a cancer cell, where uh, instead of just looking at a picture, we encoded a lot of information that has been obtained by sequencing or similar techniques. All right, so, so I mean, not to go to too much details here, it's just uh, that now we can collect this data and you see that one cell now becomes a few gigabytes of data. And, and the data is very unstructured. I mean, it's structured in this case, but with complicated structures. You have numbers, you have graphs, you have sequences, you have many things to describe one thing, right? So now, uh, 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 and so, uh, now, can we talk of big data? Well, we can talk of big data for genomics, and I would just pinpoint to one observation, which is that the, the field of genomics, uh, which, you know, which has progressed because of sequencing and this kind of technology, uh, of course, is not the only one to produce data in, in, the, in the health uh, field, or you know, when we think of can data help uh, improving cancer treatment. There are a lot of other data that people are very interested in. Uh, roughly speaking, you have more and more devices, you know, Internet of Things. So you have, uh, uh, you have your watches, your iPhones, your kind of stuff that, that continuously will more and more measure your, your state. You know, they can measure many things, your blood, your temperature, your heart, etc. Uh, each hospital has a lot, besides sequencing and genomics, has a lot of machines. Uh, there is uh, imaging, there is medical records, there are all these things that are now getting digitalized and available on databases. So you have a lot of information about each patient and, and, and more uh, that, that gets stored and, and the data becomes available. You have, of course, a lot of, of knowledge. So it's a data rich field, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a field data rich, data rich field, yeah. Uh, so you have publications, you have databases of genes, of proteins, etc. So all you know, you have some background knowledge available here. And of course, so, you know, it's, it prob we're, we're probably, uh, I mean, within 10 years, it's clear that some companies in particular have a lot of information about people. So when we, when we talk of health and, and disease, it's clear that not everything is in the genome, but you have a lot that's written on Facebook, on, on your emails, etc. So you can think, uh, I don't say you have to do it, I don't say it's good, but you can imagine that in the future, and the future may be not too far away, uh, it's te technically possible to take all this data, combining data, you know, uh, uh, your, I mean, your emails with your genome, with your friends, with your, uh, your medical record, put that into some big artificial intelligence kind of, you know, smart algorithm in order to monitor your health, cure cancer if you have cancer, or make sure you're in good health, etc., uh, preventing diseases if possible, etc. So I think that that's a bit a picture that's probably, uh, you know, a bit crazy. It's, it's not here yet, but it's clear that we go in this direction. Uh, I don't know where we will be at the end. Uh, probably we will still have doctors. We need uh, human relationships, etc. But at least potentially it's possible to, to collect all this data. And, you know, it's, 
when we talk of companies, it's clear that even the big companies, uh, when you look at who are the, the big companies that invest a lot of money in health or even in devices, etc., you, you see Google, you see Apple, you see all these guys. So it's clear that there is no big, you know, big split between uh, information science, medicine, etc. Okay, there is, uh, I don't say there is a collision, but there is a possibility that all these things get together to try to, you know, to, to have uh, uh, models and uh, uh, monitoring of health. All right, so, so that's, uh, that's where, uh, that's, that was the part on, on big data. So you have, we have big data related to health. Now question, how can we use them, um, you know, to, to, to improve treatments, etc. Uh, perhaps I will, I will be a bit more specific now on typical applications that we foresee in the near future, even in the present. So the kind of questions which are important when, when you talk of, of treating cancer, improving cancer treatment, uh, are things like improving uh, so prevention. So prevention could be if you can, before there is a disease, predicting what's the risk of disease, uh, given the genome, given the environment, then you may take measures to try to decrease the risk. There, there is uh, things about diagnosis. So cancer is a, is a very heterogeneous disease because as you see, each cancer is unique in a sense. Each cancer cell in, in someone comes from your own DNA as its own random sequence of events leading to some phenotype, so some, some properties of the cells. So if you take two different people with cancer, they have very different genomes, very different things. So, uh, and this leads to many diseases that look, sometimes look the same, but can be uh, stratified into sub, sub diseases in a sense. So diagnosis, meaning uh, identifying the real disease within some subgroups for which we, we have treatments, etc., is important and could be improved by data. Another one is more about making predictions. So predictions, uh, there are two words which are widely used in this field. So one is prognosis. Prognosis is you have a disease and you want to predict what's going to happen in the future. If, for example, if you, if you don't do anything. And that's important in cancer because most of the time now we can detect cancer quite early. So for many cancers, they can be detected early. They can be treated. If you have breast cancer, it's detected early. You go to the hospital, you have surgery. They remove the tumor and you may be cured. Unfortunately, sometimes you're not cured because a few years later, you may have a relapse or cancer comes back. So uh, for most people, you're cured. And for, uh, for, I don't remember the percentage, roughly 20% of the persons, relapse uh, may, may occur. So if you are able to predict uh, what's the risk of relapse, then you may say to the people which are, who are cured, well, you're cured, uh, good for you, you're done. And for the other ones, if there is a high risk of relapse, to give treatment because uh, chemotherapy is used in this case to reduce the risk of relapse by trying to kill all possible remaining cancer cells. And chemotherapy is not a funny thing. So if, you can, uh, uh, if you can not give it to people who don't need it, it would be a huge improvement in cancer treatment. So if you can improve prognosis, sorry, then you, you can have a direct impact uh, and, and find a better balance, uh, you know, cost benefit uh, for, for treatment. And finally, uh, precision medicine is a fancy word to say, well, um, you know, in cancer, you have hundreds of drugs on the market. Uh, when they are designed, most of the drugs on the market uh, come with a, with a notice that says, well, this drug is for this kind of patients with uh, this cancer in this situation, etc., etc. But it's well known that, in fact, some drugs that, that were designed for one thing may be useful for other things. So the, the, the current view of, of, uh, of how to use drugs and, and when and in which concentration, etc., is more that you have like hundreds tools that you can use, the, the drugs. And what we would like to do is some smart engine that says for this person, given the genome of this person, the environment, the history, etc., we believe that this combination of this, this, and this together will be the best treatment to give, right? So this is what, what's meant by precision medicine, using all the information possible about one, one patient with a disease to find the optimal treatment. And the optimal treatment may be complicated if you talk of combination of hundreds of drugs you can imagine you have a combinatorial health problem and it's not obvious how to, uh, to, 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 to fit these kind of models. Okay, so, uh, so now how, how do we go towards this question? Well, because we have, we have the ability to collect data uh, and we have well-defined questions, uh, it's clear that data science in this field machine learning may be one direction that could be uh, attempted to, to try, let's say, to make a, a prognosis tool or a precision medicine tool. So to be more precise, suppose you, you, you're confronted with the problem of giving, you have one drug 
and it's, it's very often the case, you have one cancer drug and you know that it will cure some people and it may almost kill other ones. You know, drugs are very toxic, so you have, let's say, good responders and very bad responders. Uh, you would like to know which, if you have a new person, you would like to, to know if the person is going to be a good or bad responder because obviously it will affect how you, whether you, you give the person the, the treatment or not. Okay? And, and you would like to do that based, let's say, on DNA profiling. So if you focus on, on this, it sounds like a very simple binary classification problem, assuming that you have been able to collect historical data. So you, you had patients, you have genomes of these persons, you have given the drug to, to these persons, and you have observed which one respond or, or do, do not respond. So in a sense, uh, you, you get a binary classification problem where each point here would represent a, a patient, the position of the point in the space represents the genomic information. So suppose here we measure two genes. So you obtain two numbers. You can, you can plot each, each patient in 2D. And then uh, we, we, we plot a color here, black for good responders and white for bad responders. Okay? If you observe that, then it's easy. You see that you obviously have a, a big correlation between the, the, the genes and the fact that the person answers or not. So you can use machine learning to find a rule that separates the two and, and in the future that's able to predict if new persons will respond or not. Okay? This thing is solved, in, in, let's say this picture is solved in, in uh, statistics and machine learning, uh, separating 19 points in two dimensions. You have many ways to do, you can make linear kind of regressions, you can have neural networks, uh, decision trees, etc. This is solved. Okay? Now what's not completely solved and, and, and for, I mean, I would argue that for me, that's the main difficulty in this field that, that is likely not to be solved, uh, is that in, in genomic data, we are really confronted with the problem of having many, many more descriptors, variables, than samples to train the models. Okay, so we have, imagine this picture represents the data matrix. Each row would be a patient. Each column would be something that you can measure on the patient. You don't measure two genes, you measure the expression of 20,000 genes, you, you measure millions of mutations in the, in the genome, you measure the structure, etc. So you measure a lot of things, and you would like to correlate what you measure to some output that would be, for example, good or bad uh, response. Okay? Uh, of course, there are many efforts to try to sequence more and more people or to, to genotype more and more people. But it's obvious, and if you look at the history in the last 15 years, it's obvious that the field is much better at increasing the number of columns than increasing the number of rows. Because increasing the number of columns is just inventing a new technology, and people are super smart to, to invent new things to measure. And it's, you know, uh, it's a bit addictive to, to add columns, because each time you study cancer, you measure things and you say, well, but perhaps uh, there is something else we could measure. We can measure, you know, cells in the blood, or we can measure, combine that with the brain, or whatever. It's very tempting to to describe now that we have the technology to to add columns here to describe someone with more and more things. But for the machine learning part, so to to fit data, that's unfortunate. We really would would have to have less, I mean, less columns compared to to to, to samples, right? Uh, so the effect of that is that the standard machine learning don't work anymore. Right? So if you, you know, I had this picture where I had this big data, some uh, algorithm to, to, be, to make a smart doctor, training this, this algorithm will probably, uh, it's going to take a lot of time before having enough data or we need to be smart in order to really be able to learn something automatically from data in this field because we simply don't have enough observations compared to the complexity of what we measure. Okay, uh, is there any, uh, any question? And, uh, up to now, or? So if not, anyway, there will be questions uh, at the end. So if not, I, I would like now to be a, a, a little bit more precise just to illustrate, uh, you know, when I say it's going to be, uh, so uh, when I say it's going to be a bit difficult and it's not obvious to just say we have data so we will have good models. I will illustrate that on, on two things. One is uh, wh when you want to, to learn from expression data, which is, uh, a bit an old topic in this field, and people have, have tried to do that for 15 years, so it's, it's not going to be very new what I will present, but just, you know, not everybody's familiar with that, so why is it hard and, and where are we now? And then I will talk of something a, a bit more recent, which is learning from mutation data in cancer, so in particular, um, wh when you can, you know, sequence people with cancer, sequence the tumor, see what mutations, so how the, the 
tumor cells are different from the normal cells so that you can see the history specific to the cancer cell and, and say whether this can be helpful to, to make some predictions. Okay. So let's start from gene expression data. So again, uh, these are just uh, you know, two small things of my big data picture, right? Uh, I, I will not talk about integrative approaches, etc. It's very interesting, but uh, I cannot, uh, it's hard, and I don't know what to say on that for the moment. So gene expression data. Sorry, I, I will not have time to mention um, all my collaborators, but of course, I will, what, what I will present that concerns what we did is, is not done by me, but uh, with, uh, is done by collaborators and, and, and students. All right, so gene expression. Gene expression has been something uh, very popular in bioinformatics, in biology. Uh, it has been studied before the progress in sequencing because before that, and even today, there, are, there is another way to measure you know, this thing, which is called microarrays. Uh, therefore, uh, the field is a bit more mature in, in, this, in this kind of data. So gene expression, again, is, uh, remember, you have the DNA, which is roughly the same in all your cells. But uh, each cell uh, as a function, you know, does something. And to make something in particular, it needs to, to, to build proteins. Uh, there are roughly, um, and, and to make a protein, uh, the, the idea is that there are parts of the DNA called genes, which are transcribed when needed into RNAs, and the RNA is translated into a protein. Okay? So we roughly have the order of 20,000 genes in, in the DNA. And, and it's possible to measure the concentration of these RNAs here. Uh, for, for the 20,000 genes in parallel in the same time. Okay, either using microarrays or using sequencing, it's possible. Okay, so you can get this picture, and in this case, this picture now is you have samples, so you have biological samples that could be patients uh, for each, in each row, and each column will be one gene, so you have 20,000 columns. And what you see, so here these data are real data, in fact, there is a color code, but uh, there is, these are real data, Th they represent uh, in this case, uh, breast cancer patients. So uh, they are all breast cancer patients. Some, some samples, so some, some part of the tumor has been uh, taken, uh, the, the RNA has been extracted, sequenced, etc., and you get a number. And it shows you, for example, if you have uh, some, uh, some red like here, it tells you that this patient here tends to express a lot a particular gene. Okay? Uh, when it's, uh, when it's whitish, then it means that uh, compared to other ones, it does not express this gene. So by comparing the different patients, you see there is some differences. They don't express all the same genes. There are some genes which are expressed by many, many patients. Uh, and what's interesting is to try to correlate that to some uh, response variable. I think in this case, it's related to how long the person survived without metastasis. Uh, so this is, uh, this is uh, more related to prognosis. Here we want to predict, uh, based on gene expression at time t, uh, whether in the future the person is cured or whether the, there is a high risk of, of relapse. Okay, so this is a typical, uh, you know, if you, if you end up with a binary label, which is the case here, it's again one of my pictures where you have uh, the, the, the black and white points, you want to find a rule, but you are in high dimension compared to the number of samples. So how can you uh, try to improve the situation? Well, an obvious answer would be if I have too many features, let's reduce the number of features and do something like feature selection, right? So moving from 20,000 genes to a smaller number of genes, 10, 20, hundred perhaps, uh, and hope that if you focus just uh, on less genes, then it's going to be possible you know, to, to keep the interesting genes and to learn a rule that would allow you to predict the output. So that's an obvious idea, and that's an idea that many people, uh, is, is obvious but good, okay, a good idea to try that. And it has been done, and in particular, uh, you know, there are, there are some success stories in the field. So if you go to the hospital today, uh, if you have a early stage breast cancer, then maybe the doctor will propose you this test called MammaPrint, uh, which has been, uh, uh, which is the result of this kind of analysis. Okay, so it was done in, in already some time ago, but it takes time to, to validate, etc., to have a product on the market. But this thing has been obtained exactly this way. Uh, some people made a systematic study on um, roughly 200 patients, expression matrix, response. Uh, selection of 70 genes in this case, uh, which were the most correlated with the output using some tests, and linear model to predict uh, the risk of relapse. Okay? And it was shown that uh, this, this kind of model, based on gene expression, uh, is better than the state of the art of the clinics. 
So it was shown through clinical uh, trials, etc. So now it's a validated product that, that's in the clinic. So this is a success of you know, data science and, and, and it's not really machine learning, but kind of predictive models. Uh, and in particular, you know, the, no, no human being decided which genes to include, etc. This was purely a statistical uh, machinery that, that now uh, does the job. Okay, so it seems to be a, a good thing. And obviously people started to say, well, we have found the 70 genes responsible or at least predictive for the risk of a lapse. Now at the time, there, there were several people who tried to do that, several groups doing that. And one, one famous controversy uh, is that roughly the same time, so the publications are a bit different, but the studies were roughly in the same time. Uh, two groups did the same thing. They tried both uh, for the same cancer uh, in, their, in their hospital to, to uh, measure ex gene expression for breast cancer, predict survival. And they, they made the same kind of model, so gene selection, linear model. Uh, both models seem to work, you know, in cross-validation, etc. Uh, and both are sparse, so one uh, uses 70 features, 70 genes, the other one 76 genes. And, and when you compare the two lists, you know, you could think that, well, if they have found the, the, the breast cancer genes, uh, they should be the same, right? In fact, there are three genes in common among the, the, two, the two lists, okay? Uh, so people started thinking, well, um, uh, why? You know, it's not... Uh, Naively, the reason in statistics for these are statisticians, the reason why we do feature selection is typically we believe that most of the genes are useless and a few of them are useful, so we want to find them. And if you find them, you should find them, you know, and uh, there should be a list that, that's important. Here, it's not the case, it's different. Uh, you get 70 genes, uh, three genes in common among 70 genes. So you could say, well, perhaps it's because the technology was a bit different, the hospital was different, etc. But there has been a subsequent uh, follow-up work, and I will not explain this picture, but that showed that, in fact, even if you have the same data set, uh, you just randomly split it in two parts to say, well, I, suppose you have 200 patients, you say I will split it in twice 100, I will learn two signatures, so two feature selection on each part, and compare if I get the same result. It's a standard way to measure the stability of feature selection. Then whatever technique you use to, to do the feature selection, it could be a simple statistical test, or it could be a complicated machine learning uh, approach, you never get more than three genes in common, okay? So it's more a property of, of just of the matrix, in fact, of the, of the design matrix, which is full of correlation, uh, which, so there is signal, you know, the, the prediction is not random, you capture the signal, but probably uh, this is a, a type of data where uh, gene se feature selection, uh, and it's not obvious that it improves the performance, but certainly does not capture a limited set of things which are uniquely defined as the good genes for cancer, right? And it has been shown even that if you just randomly pick 70 genes, then you get the same performance, okay? So, you know, it has implications even in terms of patenting, etc., because of course there's been a, it's, it's a big market, this kind of thing, so, so the first signature, the list were patented, and they say these are our genes, they are important. In fact, if you want to get a patent in this field, you just pick the genes which are not patented yet, and, and they, are, they will provide a, a, a signature good, uh, the, you know, good enough. And this is in this picture the, the random strategy uh, as, as some performance which is similar to everybody else. Okay? So for me, I mean, it's a sign. It's not a sign that everything is, is, uh, is crazy here. It's a sign that probably there is a mismatch between what, you know, what, we, what we think and, and the reason why we apply some techniques and, and the data or the, the reality. The, it's, not, it's not really... Uh, clear uh, uh, if this is a good idea. Okay, how can you try to improve that? So now I will talk a, a little bit of things that, that me and collaborators have been trying to do. So what, one thing, just to illustrate, you know, how, what kind of research it generates in machine learning and statistics. So one thing that's possible is to say, well, how do, so in this picture, how do you estimate this line? There is one family of algorithms that that work by uh, uh, formulating the search for a good classifier as some optimization problem. And typically an optimization problem where you, you search over the, the set of, so in this case, linear models. I will just focus on linear models here. And you say, uh, I want to fit the linear models by minimizing uh, a term that measures how good the linear model is. So you have a first term that, that measures how well your line separates the points. And in high dimension is not enough because there are many linear models that would perfectly separate any, any types of points. So typically in addition to that, you minimize, so this measure of how well you, you, you separate the points plus a penalty that can be talked of as some prior, you know, prior constraint you put on, on your model saying, among the models that separate well my data, I want the one that has the smallest something, okay? 
uh, typical examples of penalties are the norms of, of beta. So if beta is, is uh, the weight, uh, is a vector of weight for a linear model, then if you use the L2 norm, so the sum of beta i square as a penalty, you end up with very state-of-the-art algorithms, like support vector machine, ridge regression, etc. If instead you, you decide to, to control what's called the L1 norm, so the sum of absolute values of the, of the coefficients, then you obtain also very state-of-the-art machines, uh, like the lasso, boosting kind of stuff. Uh, so it seems, you know, there are good default penalties and they are used in many applications of, of machine learning and data analytics these days. Uh, so I will focus on, on, on sparsity and, and the lasso. So in particular, one of the penalties, as I said, is the L1 norm. So if, if you have a risk function, let's assume it's, it's convex and smooth, and you penalize it with the L1 norm of beta, then it's well known that it leads to, when you optimize it, the solution will be a vector of beta which contains a lot of zeros. It will be sparse. And one very, you know, one way, one way to understand that is that the, the, if you look at, at this function, so this penalty, and, and, uh, and if you constrain it to be bounded by a number, because you know, minimizing uh, the risk plus the penalties is the same as minimizing the risk and the constraint on the penalty, then uh, because the L1 ball, unit ball, or, uh, is, is in fact a square in 2D, and in higher dimension, it's, it's a, you know, it's, it's a, it's a non-smooth uh, convex uh, object, then when you minimize a smooth risk uh, under the constraint to be in the square, very often you, you can show that you are on one of the vertices or on one edge, and the vertices and the edges correspond to sparse models. Okay, so that's the idea of how, how you can learn, for example, a signature. If you want to learn a signature of 70 genes, do feature selection, you can do it by convex optimization with this kind of, of thing. Now we, we saw that it's not enough in the sense that if you just do that, then you will get 70 genes, but it's not better than just randomly choosing 70 genes. So what else can you do? Well, what one interesting extension or generalization of, of L1 penalty is the, uh, is the broader notion of <laughs> atomic norms, which is just obtained the same way uh, by changing um, the basic element. So remember, I just showed a, a square to say this is the unit ball of the L1 norm, right? It's convex and it's non-smooth. Now there are many other ways to make convex and non-smooth sets, and in particular, you can choose a few points like this and consider the convex hull of these points, okay? This thing, if you choose well the, the points, will be a unit ball of some penalty, of some norm, in fact, if, if, you know, if zero is inside, okay? So if you do that, then the same idea as lasso can be used. If you design such, such a shape, by, so here what you do is you define a few, it could be many, but you define some extreme points, and then you take the convex hull, then you get a shape, and if you minimize your risk constraint to be in this shape, or equivalently your risk plus lambda times the function for which this is a, a level set, then you, will, uh, you can show that uh, the result of optimization will be typically one atom or a sparse combination of atoms, right? So this is a generalization of L1 that, that says that if you not only want to select features, but to select a few basic elements, uh, if you define a, a kind of basis, then it's possible to design some atomic norm to do that. Okay, so it's a general concept. Uh, it turns out to be, you know, this idea works well with fast uh, optimization because there are specific algorithms to, because you know you are sparse, you can, you can implement algorithms that, that will benefit from the sparsity at, at the end, just like for the L1. So let's try to apply this concept to, for example, uh, tr uh, trying to use some prior knowledge. Uh, so remember, uh, I have 20,000 20, columns. I said these are the genes, uh, and I think, you know, there are many correlations between the genes, etc. So you have to think, what, what do I know about the genes? And we know many things about the genes. The genes are, uh, you know, have been studied a lot by, by in biology before we, we did genomics like that, okay? So one, one notion, one thing that we know about the genes, for example, is that they, they don't work alone. They often work together. Uh, and we have, I will not explain all the details again, but we have networks of genes either that represent either some physical interactions between the proteins that are generated, you know, coded by the genes, or that represent the functions of the genes. So some genes do some function, and this thing has to be followed by some other genes, etc. So you have some knowledge uh, about links, uh, possible links between the genes that you can, you know, and you have databases on the web that, that give you different networks. So you have different semantics, but you have these networks. 
So it's a bit, uh, you know, if you do image analysis, it's a bit like, um, like the grid of pixels. You could say when I have an image, I have many pixels, so I could just say I have 10 million pixels and I make a, a model on my 10 million pixels. Or you could say, well, my pixels, they are arranged over a grid and I want to use this grid to, uh, you know, to put some prior knowledge and do something that, uh, that I could not do if I didn't know where the pixels come from. So here's the same, we have 20,000 genes. Can we use something like that to try to do something better than just uh, saying it's a vector of 20,000 dimensions? All right, well, so something you can do, and uh, you know, it's, it's one among many, many uh, papers that have tried to do things, but uh, at least this one I uh, worked on that, uh, is to, to make some atomic norm uh, using the network to define the atoms. Okay, so how, how would that work? Well, in this case, suppose you are given a network here. Uh, I show you just a network with six genes, but the real one is, is bigger. Uh, then you, you could take, for example, all edges. So an edge is a set of two, uh, two genes. And in the, so let's look at this picture here. Imagine this represents the space of 20,000 dimensions, so the space in which we want to learn. Each time you have two connected genes, you can draw a circle, just a, a two-dimensional circle, in the subspace spanned by the two genes. So, for example, here, uh, you can imagine that you can guess there is a horizontal circle here. Well, we will draw this circle if the horizontal plans that you see on, 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 this, uh, on this picture corresponds, for example, to genes one and four. Okay, so if you have, if the horizontal space is one and four, you draw a circle uh, in this, in this uh, just uh, two-dimensional circle here, uh, because one and four are connected. And you can do that uh, for all edges, okay? So uh, it requires, you know, some, uh, uh, you know, you have to think about it, but you're in dimension 20,000, and you draw, uh, if you have, uh, you know, 50,000 edges, you draw 50,000 circles in this space, but just uh, spanning the different two-dimensional subspace of connected edges. And then you draw the connected component, okay? So this thing is just one atomic norm where the atoms are the circles, and where the convex hull is just here to, is the smallest convex set uh, that, uh, that contains all the circle. Now you see that uh, this is convex, but it's not smooth. You have singularities, and the singularities are precisely the, the circles here that, that you design to be your, atom, your atoms, right? So you can think that if you, if you can use these as constraint and you, you fit a model to separate your points and you constrain the model to be in this, uh, in this shape here, then you can show that the solution uh, will uh, very likely be either exactly on one circle or more likely on, you know, on a, on a finite small set of circles. Like a low, so it will be sparse over your atoms, okay? And so what does sparse means here? Well, you see that if you're on one circle, it means exactly that all coordinates are zero except for the two genes that were used to define the circle. Okay, so this is a way to get as basis, so you, you will be sparse at the end, your, your vector beta will be uh, sparse over the genes, but it will be non-zero on atoms, and the atoms will be pairs of connected genes. And in fact, if you study a bit more the, the details of this thing, you can show that the atoms are not independent here, because they are, you know, a gene can be in different uh, atoms, and uh, you can show that as soon as, for example, suppose one four becomes non-zero, then it increases the, the chance that a connected atom will be not zero two. Okay, so you have, uh, you, in a sense, it's a way to do a kind of structure feature selection, where at the end we select genes that will tend to be connected on the network. Let's visualize that. Well, for example, uh, it's, okay, you don't see much here, but uh, this is a signature, uh, a representation of a signature. So probably sixty genes that was estimated using lasso. Okay, so you get sixty genes. And then we map this gene to a network to see if they, they are connected, to try to make a story. And it's very hard to see, but you just have a few genes connected here, but the rest are isolated. Now, if instead of that, we start from the network and we say, let's learn 60 genes that will tend to be connected, then of course you get, again, the edges are hard to see, but you get uh, bigger connected components. You get, so your six genes that were connected in the other method are still connected, but now they form a bigger connected component. And here you see appear a few more connected components. Okay, if you're interested in, in biology, these are ribosomal proteins, these are cell cycle proteins, so they make sense in this story. It's not surprising, and it's just a way to drive a bit the search for uh, for, for for genes. Okay, 
And as byproduct, this thing is a bit more stable. So in terms of when you do that twice on different studies, do you get more uh, stable uh, of genes? Yes, you get. And what's hard is that uh, it's, it's hard to really improve the performance because, you know, ideally you would say, well, if I have a better model, then it should predict better too. My, my goal is that at the end. Uh, here I just show some accuracies, which, in fact, if I put the error bars are not are slightly better, but it's, it's not big and it's, it's not always significant. So we are still struggling to improve the performance, but this kind of ideas goes in the direction of putting a bit prior knowledge and, um, and learning things. Okay, so by the way, if you're interested in atomic norms, there are you know, many, many other atomic norms if you want to learn to do this joint feature selection, this kind of thing. So it's, it's a tool, you know, once you, you know, once you know it, it's a tool that allows you to, uh, to, to do convex optimization and, uh, learn, and learn many things. And, and I don't know if Francis is here, but you can ask Francis back, he knows all that very, very well. All right, uh, so let me move on and I will, I will just keep uh, this, this thing because uh, let me move on quickly to, to uh, a, a second example, uh, just to illustrate again the, the difficulty. So I said gene expression uh, has been around for 15 years, so we still work on them, but you know, I've, many people have tried and, and, and it's hard to, to do much better to, to improve the accuracy, etc. So uh, of course, uh, I hope we will get more samples at some point, and perhaps by increasing the number of samples, we may reach a better performance for different kinds of applications I mentioned. But overall, we are very, very far from, um, so we don't know what's the limit. You know, the, the probably there is a limit in the information uh, encoded in the gene expression and how much it can predict uh, if a drug will work or not. But we don't know what's the limit uh, and we may be quite far away from it still. So very quickly, I'd like, I'd like to mention uh, uh, so, some recent work on, on mutation. It will be, you know, there, there is no, no technique here. It's just, it's more descriptive. It's joint work with Marine uh, Le Morvan and Andrei Zinoviev. Uh, and so it's about somatic mutation. I just want to mention it because this is like the new exciting data in cancer research. So somatic mutation, what does that mean? So here we talk of mutations, which are changes in DNA and somatic mutations are the, the changes in DNA between uh, that occurred since your birth. Okay, so remember that since your birth you had one cell dividing and dividing again and again. A somatic mutation is a mutation that occurred during the divisions. So typically if you have a cancer, you have cancer cells, you have a tumor, you have normal cells elsewhere and you can compare their genomes and they are not exactly equal. In particular cancer cells acquired a lot of mutations, so this is illustrated here where in fact, it's a, you know, it's a process that takes years and years because it's, it's not one mutation, it's often it's the accumulation of many mutations. And so a question is, uh, if you have a, a, a cancer, you look at the difference between your cancer cell and normal cells, then you see uh, what mutations your, you know, the cells got to become crazy. And you could say, well, this should tell me a lot about my cancer because now I, I should know, uh, you know, if this is this mutation or this one or this one, perhaps. Uh, it became crazy because of that, and perhaps there is a drug to, to cure or to treat these kind of mutations. Okay, so these mutations now, uh, because of, uh, of sequencing technology, you can uh, access them, and now there are many international or private, but mostly uh, you know, big public projects that systematically in the hospital say, well, you have a tumor, let's sequence your tumor and collect the data so that we will acquire thousands, tens of thousands of, of genome cancers. And then by doing statistical analysis, uh, identify frequent mutations or mutations predictive for some, you know, uh, survival or uh, uh, the, the fact that you, uh, you respond to a treatment. So if you go online now, for example, this was, we, we, we did that a few months ago, but so now the, the numbers will be a bit bigger. But so it's not easy to get the, I mean, to get the data, uh, you need to sign papers to apply, etc., because these are private uh, you know, uh, human data. But you can, you can get a few thousands of, of, of mutation, uh, so somatic mutation data that tell you, so it's a matrix like this. Here, I reduce it by just looking again at the gene level. And so each row, imagine each row is a patient and each column is again a gene. And here, I just plot a binary indicator whether or not the gene has been mutated, so it's different between the tumor and the normal cell. Okay, so you get a 20,000 dimensional vector of zero and ones. And this is the data, uh, uh, you know, a subset of the data. Okay, so you can say, well, let's try to use this data and, and people tried saying, well, let's, can this predict something useful? Okay, so 
one thing useful uh, is, I said, the prognosis. You know, if at time t you, you have a cancer, you would like to, to assess the risk of, of, uh, so of relapse, uh, if you're cured or not. And so the, the simplest you can do is you take the data as input, you make a regression model. So in this case, we talk of survival model, but it's, it's a kind of, of, of regression to predict the time until uh, the, uh, the, the relapse. And you can do cross validation. So we did it, and others did it. You do cross validation to assess how good it works. You know, the, is it a solved problem or is it difficult? Uh, these results here, I mean, um, uh, represent what's called the concurrence index. So it's, it's a measure of performance of how well you predict survival. Okay. What uh, the bad news is that uh, here the the numbers go from 0.5 to 0.75. In fact, 0.5 is random prediction. When you do random prediction, you get a concordance index of 0.5. If you make a perfect prediction, so meaning that uh, in cross validation, uh, you are able to, to say that based on this mutation, I predict that this guy will live long or not long, you get a concordance index of 1. Okay? Each box plot corresponds to one cancer. There were several cancers <laughs> lung cancer, skin cancer, breast cancer, etc. And what you see is that basically you are not far from random prediction. Okay? 0.5 is the line here. In some, you are really not different from 0.5. And in some, you're a bit better, but you're still under 0.6. OK? So it's a hard problem. It, you know, people hoped that it would, you know, just doing that would, we, we didn't know. It, we, and, uh, we tried. People hoped that we would get good results. So at least that's the reason why all these, you know, millions and hundreds of millions of dollars have been invested to sequence the thing. The direct application here doesn't work. Okay, so we don't know if it's because there is no information or if it's because we don't use the data well. And what's troubling, so something that's, uh, that's puzzling here is that when you look at the data, they are extremely sparse. Uh, typically, on one person, so one cancer has a few hundreds of mutations among 20,000. So we are talking of 99% sparsity, typically. Less than 1% of the, of the genes are, are one and the rest are zeros. And there is a very little overlap between two different patients. So you see some columns here. So some columns pop out. These are genes which are uh, mutated in many patients. And in, for all these cases, in fact, these are well-known genes that have been studied for 20, 30 years. P53 is, the, is known to be mutated in 30% of, of most cancer, and you recover it. So you recover the easy thing quite easily, but the hope would say, well, now that we can see all this, all this let's use these smart, these smart learning engines and do something better. And it seems to be a failure for the moment, right? Uh, perhaps it will change when we will not have 400, but 4,000 or 40,000 samples, but we don't know. It's an open question. So something, uh, and this would be uh, the, 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 last, uh, the last thing, something where, you know, we, we tried, and, and not only us, but people are thinking about is, well, perhaps it, we are not very smart to just say, let's, t let's you know, take this as input. So we take this matrix, we launch uh, some Python or R software to do a uh, Cox regression or this kind of thing, and it doesn't work. So perhaps we didn't do a good, a good job, and we, we should try more carefully to you know, to, 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 to understand what was the information here and whether we could, for example, use prior knowledge about the genes, as I said before, to change the presentation or to do something else, right? To try to fight a bit more on this, on this matrix to see if there is really no signal, okay? So a general idea, and, uh, you know, we did something, but I think, it's, it's, of course, it's a bigger idea, which, which probably will, you know, will be explored by, by many people, is uh, instead of looking for binary, binary vector of dimension P, can you find another representation of your thing that would not be binary, that, that would ideally you know, um, extract the good information in some features and, and, and then would ease the, the process of learning from that? All right, so something we, we did, but uh, again, it's, it's, it's very simple and it's like a first attempt and we are not the only one to do that, is uh, uh, perhaps I will, I will just, yeah. Uh, so you have your input matrix, and uh, what about using some gene network? So the similar gene network, as I said before, for gene expression. You know that genes don't work together, and you know that if you have a mutation, typically, instead of just focusing on one gene, it may be relevant, people believe it's relevant, to look at which part of the network are mutated. Because it suffices to have one mutation some, in some area of the network, perhaps to inhibit some function and, and lead to cancer. So we say, well, wh what about using a, a, a network and and change representation to move in the space of, you know, subpath or subnetworks, etc. So we did something like that. You know, the, uh, 
uh, it's just a recipe is to say, well, uh, here is our new representation. So we, we made a, a way to use, it's not smoothing, but this kind of, you have, so your raw data is like binary over the network and you can extend it or, or, or modify it a bit to, by, by if, if your neighbor is mutated, then you could say you are a bit mutated, for example, this kind of thing. I don't go to the details. Uh, other, other folks have, have done similar things. And here is what we got. So again, it's one attempt and it's certainly not the, 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 the best one or, or the last one. But if we apply, uh, so in, in green, so the left box plot for each cancer is the raw data, is the same as I, I showed earlier, which is bad overall, except for some cancers. And, and the other box plot, so the, our, our two methods, so ours and some competitors, uh, where we use the network. And you see that uh, it doesn't solve the problem. So for most cancer, there is no difference. So you know, we tried and it just doesn't work. Uh, but there is some hope in some cancers, in this case, uh, skin melanomas and, and lung cancer, for which it seems that uh, using this gene network to change a bit the representation and then running a model increases a bit. Uh, so it's significant, but it's not huge. But we, we move from 50, 55% to 60, 65%. Uh, concordance index. So we are still very, very far away from having a useful uh, predictor at the clinics. But it seems to go in the good direction. So to say that uh, perhaps working more on how you represent the data, understanding this, may lead to some improvement. Okay? But you see, it's not, it's not an easy process. And the, 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 the magic of, of machine learning doesn't work. If you just put the raw data, uh, you just don't have enough. It, it may work if you had billions of, of training examples to automatically learn the rules. But here, I believe that in this field, we, uh, there is a real need to um, uh, probably to do some more engineering and, and based on biology or what we believe to try to improve the situation. All right, I think uh, I, I, will, I will skip. So there are a few technical details, but not very important for, the, uh, for, for, this, for this talk. So in conclusion, you know, my goal was first to show you very roughly why we talk of big data and we, are, we will talk more and more of big data. And this is an important field. So people are interested by their health. Uh, I think it's a cool application domain, domain for data science where, you know, you can save life uh, uh, perhaps. Uh, but, um, but we should not be naive. Uh, the data are big, but they are not big in the good, uh, you know, in the good direction. Uh, we, we have a lot of data on each of you, but uh, we should have more, pe you know, more people uh, to, and less, uh, less things to, if you, if you, just for the purpose of, of automatic learning from data. Uh, my, my feeling, so what, what we are working on uh, and others are uh, how to change a bit the automatic method that exists by changing representation, changing regularization, etc. It's a very uh, uh, interesting you know, there is a lot to be done if, if you're a student and you want to work in this field. I think there, there are a lot of opportunities. Uh, but again, uh, I think some data seem complicated. Some problems seem complicated. And everybody we tried, other people tried, say, well, we have the data, just train a model, just train a deep learning or SVM or whatever and see if it works. It just doesn't work uh, as it is. So, uh, you know, it's not a field where you get easy uh, easy success. I don't say you will never get them, but probably it will take some time. And 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 you know there is a big the buzz on artificial intelligence, uh, data science uh, will cure cancer, etc. I think we are very very far for, from it, and I hope I, I convey why uh, I believe so. All right, thank you for your attention. I don't know if we have time for. <laughs> Thanks very much for this beautiful talk. Uh, what you've been showing is that uh, the major limitation is the number of examples uh, or the number of patients. And the same phenomena appeared, uh, for example, in vision, in audio, and so on. As long as there was not enough examples, the methods were just not working. So in the case of medicine, uh, is this changing? I mean. I've heard that, for example, in England, they were building very large cohort of, of uh, patients to go from few hundreds to tens of thousands. Uh, it looks like it's the main issues, given what... Yeah, well, so to, to, to answer, so the first is, yes, it's changing. And uh, I, I showed some, some statistics on TCGA, so on the mutation data, I say there are a few thousand things. So this is already much bigger than they were 
a few years ago. And there are big projects uh, in the US, in UK, even in France. There is a France genomic medicine project uh, decided this summer to sequence uh, several thousand, uh, several hundreds of thousands of, of people, disease or, or not disease, uh, in the coming years. So yes, there, there, there it's going to change for sure. Now, uh, I, I don't know if that's the only issue. What I say is just that here, clearly, it doesn't work as we wish it would work. So perhaps it doesn't work because we don't have enough data. Now, uh, we need to try. I don't know if the, we need a few hundreds of thousands, or if we need billions, etc. It will go in the good direction, but we have very little um, knowledge about whether this is the main issue, or how far we can go if we get 100,000 samples, for example. This is, this is better understood, for example, in, uh, in standard genetics. So genetics is about you take a population, and you correlate differences in, in, in DNA, for example, with some phenotype. And there it's, you know, statistical tests and we have, uh, we have some, uh, not only we have all the statistics that tell you what's the power of your test, depending on the number of samples, but also we, we have some other knowledge based on studying families, for example, to know what's the upper limit. Because if you have some genetic signal, then you can re recover it within families uh, differently from diff between families. So in the field of genetics, we have better knowledge of what's the limit. And, and there is something, you know, uh, we make predictions here, the limit here. And this thing is called missing heritability in a sense. So this we know pretty well. In this domain, we have very little knowledge whether, you know, wh where we can go. Uh, in the first part, uh, the first example, you, you showed that you can get uh, identified genes which are uh, known to be connected wi with the method and that this is more robust. In that case, what, what feedback do you have from the biologist on this uh, set of uh, connected genes? genes? Well, um, so I, I quickly said that in this case there are mainly two, two comp connected components that, that, that popped out uh, and, and you know, the feedback are good in a sense that this is not a surprise. These are the ones, we know that these, these pathways, uh, so cell cycle obviously and the ribosomal proteins too, we know that they are involved in, in cancer and that put probably uh, they are related to, to some phenotypes uh, that, that are related to the survival, which is what we studied here. So we didn't get really, uh, we didn't push that much, I would say. So, you know, we did that, we showed it, it was okay, obviously you get what, it's not surprising. In fact, it was a bit, uh, we didn't get something exciting in a sense, right? We, we recovered the, the, uh, the, the obvious thing that, that we have to recover uh, that other methods did not recover, but uh, we didn't get uh, much interesting. But you're correct that one important uh, thing that I did not talk about is that uh, we may have like a magical uh, robot at the end here, but in the meantime, what's more important uh, before we reach a completely, uh, you know, uh, era where there is no, no doctor anymore, is to communicate with, with biologists and doctors. And these past models, etc., are certainly one way to, uh, to, to, to get models that, are, that can be explained. And th this is going to be probably the, the main game changer in the practice if, if you can have the medical community accept these models, uh, they, they need to be understandable, etc. Yes? Uh, <coughs> excuse me. Did you consider uh, the type of cancers into that uh, ma matrix of number of patients and uh, the... Uh, yeah, so, so wh what I... So all, all the things I, I... All the results I showed, for example, were just for one type of cancer. I combine them. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah, that, that's uh, that's an interesting idea to say. Uh, uh, you know, I showed this table where you, um, I say in total you have three thousand samples, but in fact, all the experiments I showed are just made on four hundred or three hundred because I do them cancer by cancer. So that's certainly a, a good a good thing. Yeah, uh, we did not do it, but some people. I've tried, and that's that's probably uh, you know it, it leads to I don't know multitask learning or combining things. Uh, this could be an interesting direction to have more data. Yeah. 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 Uh, very nice talk. Um, you never discussed uh, issues of computational complexity of your algorithms and when the amount of data increases as as much as uh, what you mentioned in the future. Is yeah. there going to be a point where computational requirements are going to be really the bottleneck? Uh, 
I don't know. I, I mean, we are, so we are very, currently we are very far from from hitting the the, the bottleneck uh, because so all, all the methods that I described are pretty fast. Uh, fast meaning they they can run on a few you know maximum a few. It goes from seconds to days, but uh, given you know given how long it takes to collect the data, you can afford having a cluster running. Uh, uh, so so no, we didn't reach uh, a limit, but it may in the future, and I think. So what the practical problems we have now, uh, even at Institute Curie or in this field, it is typically how, where do you store the data? How do you store the data? How do you access them, etc.? Here I just showed, you know, these matrices. Once it's a matrix, it's a sparse matrix. This is a small object, right? But to, before that, uh, there is a lot of pre-processing. In fact, what comes from the sequencing machine is not at all this, this, uh, this matrix. It's a it's uh, gigabytes or terabytes of short trees that need to be processed. So for the moment, the bottleneck, uh, the computational bottleneck is not in the learning part. It's clearly in the pre-processing, uh, storage of data, etc. And I suspect it's going to be like that uh, for some time. Yeah. So. So indeed. So so this picture is only uh, is only made of somatic mutations. So the ones you know what we observe different in each person between the normal cells and the cancer cells. Obviously, I didn't talk at all about the fact that even the normal cells are different between persons. So obviously, uh, something I could add here is a second set of columns where, in addition to the somatic mutations, we may want to take into account the genetic background, so the the, the genome of the of the normal cells. Well, you know, what we try to, what we hope here, so the rationale be behind this approach would be to say that even though persons are different, uh, perhaps the, the cancer process follows similar path in different persons, and this path, in this case, would be observed in the somatic mutations, right? So this is just based on this hypothesis that we can make this kind of, of stories. And, and this is why I'm not sure exactly what's the amount of information there is here. But in this particular case, the idea, uh, you know, uh, uh, we know that, that, that the cancer progresses through accumulations of mutations. It would be well, can we, by ob so if we observe, you know, for me, if we observe more samples, it just means that we get more statistical power. Uh, can we get better statistical power to capture the events that are recurrent in some cancer and that are prognostic or predictive of, of response, etc.? cetera? So you also get more average. As you get more samples, like if you dilute out potential information, specific, especially if the statistics. Well, so, so, so uh, are you referring to the fact that if we have more samples, they will have to come from a broader spectrum of, of disease, perhaps? or? Well, even from the same disease, if, if say, what you're trying to capture is a, is a tem temporal statistical signal, um, <laughs> You know, it's sort of like Facebook, uh, Amazon recom uh, recommendations, right? They're given for an average person, and you just put into one of the categories of an average person. They're not, whereas, you know, here we're talking about something way more important than what book you should write. Yeah, well, I'm not sure. I mean, you could also say that, you know, if you have more samples to train your model, then you, you'll be able to see more diversity. And if, if you have one billion things to some, you know, uh, one billion samples, then perhaps for one person, even if you do things like a nearest neighbor, you know, you look with similar, then the more samples you have, the, the more diversity you will have explored, and therefore the, the, the more specific you could be. You wouldn't perhaps use everybody, but perhaps for one person, see that, uh, you know, very practically, you have a patient, you could say, well, it looks very similar to this patient. And if you have seen many, many patients, you could be more specific by having someone very specific looking the same. So I think it, it can also help to have more patients to be more specific about each, each individual by better covering the, the space and, and the diversity. Perhaps last two questions. 
Uh, sorry, I have two questions, actually. <laughs> so, uh, very quick, then, on the two parts you presented. And thank you very, uh, very much for the nice talk. Um, on the predicting, uh, I mean, on the prognosis on breast cancer uh, using gene expression data, you showed that there was some a success story in 2002 uh, using uh, obt obtaining 70 genes. Yeah. And another success story in 2005 saying sort of showing that 70 other genes yeah. basically would be also uh, interesting it, was it that they were both useful at predicting uh, at, at at prognosis or, or yeah yeah and, is and it one of them is wrong and how oh no no they, they are both as good okay. uh, and basically they do more or less the same classification and you know th this part has been controversial because for example uh, even though they, they are based on different genes, it has been studied that, in fact, they capture some, very, some, some signal uh, that can be seen on many subsets of genes, and that's more or less what doctors already used before. Mm -hmm. There are a few major subtypes of, of cancer, so these signatures capture, you know... Uh, so it was not unique, but it was both useful. Yeah, yeah, sure, okay. sure, yeah. And the second question is about the second part, the mutation. Uh, you, s you showed that one of the methods you developed was better at what predicting uh, uh, one of in this case, pro there was cancer. one of the cancer uh, yeah, that, that yeah. worked a bit wasn't it could it not be that uh, this is related to the to the um, uh, to the amount of research that is done on this part of the mo molecular network <laughs> that you that oh, concern that's possible, that this yeah. is yeah, yeah that's possible and how could you know that how could you measure whether this is because of that or not <laughs> uh, i don't know so so yeah, good, good question. So it's true. I mean, more generally, it's clear that uh, when I say let's use prior knowledge to, to uh, you know, constrain or enforce something, we are all dependent on this prior knowledge. And for example, if the prior knowledge is, uh, as you say, there is more research in a field and there is more prior knowledge in this field. I think here probably it's not the case in particular because the, the, the you know, the, the network we used, we use several, but some are just based on experimental data without biases. Like you, you try to, to measure interactions between proteins. So it's not a question of doing research in a field. It's more you systematically you get a network. Um, so there, there is no reason why it should be uh, more focused on, on one cancer or the other. But there are other reasons why, you know, even when you talk to people who know the cancers, there are reasons why you expect some cancers to, to have predictive signals and not others. There is, a, you know, when we talk of the, at this level of diversity, uh, for example, uh, lung cancer, skin cancers have a lot of mutations, other ones have less mutations, uh, etc. So there, there are things that we know and it's not a complete surprise to see these results. All right, last questions. I see a lot of hands rising. Uh, we have plenty of time during Yeah, the we can talk at lunch. So thanks for your talk. Um, I was wondering, so you mentioned that to increase the stability of the prediction, you, you can pass through a representation of the information. Instead, in, instead of using raw data, you represent the data in some way. So I was wondering if you can comment on how you build this representation, because you know you can do this in a prior way, like in, in a basis known like Fourier or wavelet basis, or you can do in a non-supervised or supervised way. And in this kind of problems, it is, looks very interesting and very difficult, in which you don't have that many samples per, yeah. per class. Maybe non-supervised <coughs> presentation could give, could give some, some hints. So I was wondering if you can comment on this. Yeah, sure. I mean, um, so what I showed is, is certainly completely supervised. Uh, and I just showed the recipe, you know, how you, you make and I have Among the slides I passed, there, are, there were other recipes uh, that we have investigated. Uh, people have tr some people have tried, you know, you can do unsupervised uh, things. Uh, so I, I've never seen any big difference, so any improvement from unsupervised. But I'm, I'm, I'm so I, I would be a bit scared to uh, to completely trust unsupervised approaches because, again, we don't have much data. So it depends which unsupervised method you use, but uh, th there are some, I mean, you know unsupervised better than me. There, there are methods that require a lot of data if you want to fit a model or to, you know, to fit a network, this kind of thing. Yes, you mean to use unsupervised to find the lab to use unsupervised to find the representation and then on the representation yeah, to yeah. do supervised. That's yeah, what because you meant. When you don't have enough data, maybe non-supervised methods can, can give some, some yeah, sure, sure. But so, so what I say is that, of course, for example, uh, uh, one unsupervised method is uh, would be a PCA or random projection, this kind of thing. So this has been done, and it doesn't lead to any improvement, as far as I know, in most of these applications. Then there are more elaborate, you know, more complicated unsupervised methods. 
which in some cases require more data and probably would not work here. But, but you know, it's completely open, so. Thank you.